welcome friends to this big topic of infertility let's cover it by definition what is infertility it's an apparent failure of a couple to conceive after one year of unprotected and regular coitus in this definition the words important here are unprotected that makes it very clear that the couple is together but not using any kind of contraceptives and the other thing important is regular intercourse means they should be staying together for that one year and the coital frequency should be normal and if in this case they fail to conceive over a period of one year then we call it as infertility and then we start investigating this couple now infertility can be primary or it can be secondary what is primary that that in that particular couple conception has never occurred before that is primary infertility and secondary they have either one abortion or a live birth or a dead fetus was born means that couple has conceived before and now because of some reasons they are unable to conceive this is called as secondary infertility physiological infertility before menarche every female is infertile after menopause and during lactational period these are the physiologically infertile periods because of absence of ovulation what is sterility sterility is little different from infertility less used terminology but it is absolute inability to conceive maybe because of some congenital or acquired irreversible losses of functional gametes in that couple or in either of parents then there is these two confusing terminologies and let's get it very clear that what is fecundability and what is fecundity because mcqs can be there and they would be confusing so fecundability is probability of achieving pregnancy in a single menstrual cycle and fecundity is probability of achieving a live birth in a single menstrual cycle the difference is one says that achieving pregnancy and the other one says achieving live birth so fecundability is achieving pregnancy in a single menstrual cycle and fecundity is achieving live birth in a single menstrual cycle according to who when we talk about positive reproductive health it considers everything a woman and her state of complete physical mental and social well being and just not the absence of disease related to the reproductive tract so the reproductive health is not just related with the reproductive genital tract health it is related with her complete physical complete physical complete mental and social well being then only we can call it as positive reproductive health of a woman now this incidence of infertility is around 15% optimal age of conception is 20 to 35 years in a woman as the age advances beyond 35 or 40 fertility rate gets reduced in more commonly in females there is if there is conception there is risk of chances of malformed baby being formed or chromosomally abnormal child being born because now the age of the ova is advancing and in that case chromosomal abnormalities become more common for male age is less important compare in comparison with females but still if males have 50 years and above age in a couple then they also have decreased fertility because of decreased libido and sexual dysfunctions they are very common as the age advances so because of that fertility rate decreases why this is important because whatever definition we have applied of one year duration that the couple staying together having frequent regular coitus without any contraceptives if they fail to conceive over a period of one year then we say that let's investigate them they are infertile but if the age of the couple either of the one the parent or the patient in that couple is more if female is more than 35 years or the male is elderly beyond 45 50 years then we need not wait for one year we can start investigating that couple 
with less period maybe 6 months of time we can give them because we all know that the rate of fertility will go down. So investigate that female if she is beyond 35 years within 6 months. Understand that in infertility we have two patients together. Everything is together. History taking, we have to take history from both of them because it's a combined disease. It's not that we cannot say let's, let's investigate the female first, treat her and then concentrate on the male. It cannot be done. We have to talk to them together. History should be together. Then the counseling and the investigations, everything would be simultaneously done in both of them. The major goals of treatment of infertility are we want to identify the cause, who, which factor, who is responsible and treat them accordingly as early as possible. Provide them accurate information in the first stage of counseling only that the problem is this, the treatment is this, the expenditure is this and prepare them that they have to go through all these things. We can also talk to them about alternative methods of conception. We have to give them hopes that this is not the end. We can treat many of the disorders. If not, then there are options from IVF to surrogacy. We have to assure them that they are quite capable of having a child and that generates a positive attitude in the patient and that helps a lot in treating infertility patient. Now, as you can see on the board, infertility, we have female factors and male factors. And in female factors, two most important factors I have written. There are many. But what I have written is ovulatory and tubal and uterine. So these are two important female factors. And male factor is also very important because it shares almost 30 to 40 percent of the responsibility of the total infertile couple group. Ovulatory and the problems in ovulation 20 to 40 percent tubal pathologies along with uterine 30 to 40 percent so let's see first what are the female fertility infertility causes or factors and then we'll go and see about male infertility factors whenever we start interrogating the couple we have to talk about coital history after general history general examination before examination but coital history is very important Sometimes they come with infertility, but when we talk to them about the coital history, we come to know that whatever coitus is taking place is not proper. It's not happening the right way. And that's the simple reason that why they are unable to conceive. Kind of if there is vaginismus. Vaginismus is what? A female is very anxious or because of some other reasons, because of some pathological reasons, there is hyperesthesia which leads to spasm of the sphincter vagina and levaternai muscles whenever she goes ahead with coitus or you can find this even during pervaginal examination. So in this case, the reason is very simple that the coitus is not taking place properly. The sperms are not getting deposited where they should be getting deposited and that's the reason. So there is no point evaluating them further. This is the basic reason. Dyspareunia, that means difficult or painful coitus. There are many reasons, but there is difficulty in coitus or there is pain during coitus and because of which the coitus is improper and that's the reason why they are unable to conceive. Fixed retroversion with prolapsed ovaries. Ovaries are prolapsed in pouch of Douglas. There is fixed retroversion and because of which Whenever there is coitus, that causes tremendous pain. Inflamed adnexal diseases, teomasis, abscesses, salpingitis, tubo-ovarian masses, all these can lead to very painful coitus. Pelvic endometriosis, again a main reason for dyspareunia. So in such cases, either the patient is very uncomfortable or she doesn't go for it, she tries to avoid it, that reduces the frequency and that leads to infertility. Again, simple anxiety, maybe because of some previous unfortunate incidences or whatever ways that female has been hurt before, there can be severe anxiety generated in the female before she goes for coitus and that can also lead to infertility because conception is not just uh, very restricted to the reproductive tract, it is also related to brain hypothalamus, the feelings, everything is important. It's not just limited to a genital tract. 
and it's not easy to conceive the way it is shown in tv serials or it's not that easy there has to be a complete hypothalamo axis working together to have beautiful conception to occur in the uterine cavity now let's see causes of female infertility one by one ovarian factors as we said 20 to 40 percent so if someone asks a female that you have to be infertile but i give you a choice that what cause or factor you want to have this is a stupid thing to talk about but the message is she should say that ovarian abnormality because it is most common and the fortunate thing is it is treatable that's why this is a cause which she can ask for why i gave you this example is because you should remember this is a cause which can be treatable very easily and the success rate is very high in this particular cause ovaries they release ova every cycle that gets picked up by the fallopian tube and then sperm ascends and there is fusion we all know this but if this egg is not getting released how there would be conception that's the whole theory so in ovarian causes if there is an ovulation there will not be conception it is the most common cause very important from mcq point of view and it is the treatable cause so remember ovarian factor as the fortunate cause of infertility what are the things or what are the uh, problems which will lead to an ovulation very common pcod that is polycystic ovarian disease in which the ovum the graafian follicle is developing to a certain stage but not going further and there is accumulation around the periphery of the ovary and ovulation is just not taking place periods are irregular she will say in menstrual history that she has irregular periods maybe every one and half months or two months or three usually they are painless there can be metropathica kind of picture that amenorrhea followed by very heavy menses so that will suggest us that maybe this patient is having pco there would be other factors like obesity acne hirsutism along with these menstrual symptoms which will guide us that she may have pcod there can be luteal phase defect progesterone deficiency progesterone deficiency leads to defective implantation and thus there will be no conception hypothyroidism hyperprolactinemia uncontrolled diabetes these are all endocrine causes which will also lead to an ovulation hypothalamus is the one from where the whole menstrual cycle starts hypothalamus secretes gnrh which goes and acts on pituitary then secretes gonadotrophin in the form of fsh and lh which goes and acts on the ovary and then there is selection of the follicle and ovulation takes place but if this hypothalamus is not working properly there is dysfunction the common example is kalman syndrome in that particular case there will be an ovulation luteinized unruptured follicle again luteal phase defect and ovulation periovarian adhesion there would be ovulation but because of these adhesions either the ovum is not getting released or maybe tubes are just unable to pick up the released ovum so these are ovarian factors which will lead to infertility very commonly now let's see the other important chunk tubal tubal factors now tubes have very important role in fertility that they have the fimbria they have to pick up the released egg take it through the ciliary through the tube with the help of the ciliary movements of the ciliated epithelium of the fallopian tube it carries the sperm ascends there is fusion the embryo in early stages has to be transferred to the uterine cavity by again the ciliary movements so if the tubes are blocked either partially or completely both the things will not happen and there would be infertility what are the causes of tubal block most common any cases in country like india tuberculosis is so very common and genital tuberculosis is the cause of blocked tube a question can be asked that how are the ways tuberculosis affect the fallopian tubes so usually by blocking the tubes what are the other disorders yes the genital infections pid 
commonly salphingitis and the common organisms are gonorrhea, chlamydia and you can't forget urea plasma. So these three names they are together always taken together whenever we talk about infertility and salphingitis. They have the common infections and they damage the ciliary epithelium and the tube even though it's patent action function physiological function is lost and thus it will lead to infertility. These infections can reach either they are sexually transmitted infections or maybe because of post abortal or post delivery sepsis. So even in purpural sepsis if these infections happen and they go and damage the tube then the patient will land up in secondary infertility. Endometriosis. We all know in endometriosis the endometrial implants are outside the uterine cavity. They can be around the tube that leads to tubal inflammation. Again, there can be kinking, there can be affection of the intratubal environment and thus the tubal function will get affected. So these are the common reasons but in tubal factors I would request you to remember about tuberculosis and the common sexually transmitted diseases those are gonorrhea, chlamydia and urea plasma. Now coming to uterine factors. Again a very important thing almost they combine they form 30 to 40 percent causes from congenital malformations till fibroids everything can cause infertility what are the congenital malformations absence of uterus we can start from there that patient may come to us as a symptom of infertility and when we investigate we come to know that uterus is totally absent we all know this intersexuality the uh, syndromes, then the Mullerian abnormalities, that uterus is either totally absent or hypoplastic, very small and not able to bear a baby inside. There can be even simpler congenital anomalies like septate uterus. Again, a MCQ can be there, which is the most common uterine anomaly which leads to infertility and the answer is septate uterus. The cause is, as there is septum, Septum has very poor blood supply, decidua will not be well formed. So even though conception takes place, there will not be implantation. So septate uterus is a commonest cause as uterine anomaly for uterine factors of female infertility. Now coming to other causes, Asherman syndrome. What is Asherman's? Asher means is there is synechia formation or adhesion formation inside the uterine cavity. They may happen because of overgenous or vigorous curettage, especially if this curettage is done either for PPH, postpartum. Postpartum curettage leads to Asherman syndrome more commonly. But it can happen after any abortion process or DNC done for any specific reason. So this vigorous or overgenous curettage where not just the endometrium is curated but the vasal layer is also curated, it is done very vigorously, then it will heal with the formation of fibrotic bands inside the uterine cavity and there would be Asherman syndrome. It can happen post-abortal, purpural, post myomectomy post-metroplasty. Metroplasty is a surgery done for uterine anomalies. If there is bicornuate uterus, or if there is big septum inside then we can do septoplasty or metroplasty. So these are a few surgeries done for correction of congenital uterine anomalies. Even Asherman can take place after uterine artery embolism. Tuberculosis and cystosomiasis these infections can also lead to intrauterine cavity adhesion formation. Symptoms how the patient would present when you take her history she would give classical history of hypomenorrhea means she is having very scanty menses. She is bleeding very less. Because of these adhesions, the cavity is obliterated. That's why she has oligomenorrhea or it is called as hypomenorrhea when the blood loss is less. Amenorrhea can also be there or else there would be repeated pregnancy losses. Then coming to the other common variety which is seen in the uterine cavity is fibroids. Fibroids the locations are different but the fibroid more it is towards the uterine cavity 
more likely that it will affect the fertility. Again, the reason because of the fibroids, the cavity is either obliterated, if they are at the cornum, they can block the sperm entry. If they are at the submucous level, they will affect the nidation, the decidua would be not uh, would be defective and implantation would be affected. So fibroid is again a very important cause. Tuberculous endometritis. Again, as we have very common disease as tuberculosis, endometritis is also very common. Endometrial polyps or exposure to DS in utero. So this may also affect fertility of that female. Now coming to a little complex part that is cervical factor. What are the cervical factors? We all know that after coitus, semen gets deposited in the posterior fornix and sperm, they have this reaction with the cervical mucus. If there are antibodies present in the cervical mucus against these sperms, then naturally the forward movement of the sperms would be affected and there would be infertility. So this is presence of anti-sperm antibodies in the cervical mucus which will lead to non-motile or non-progressively motile. They may be motile but the movement will not be progressive. There will be just shaky or rotatory movement of the sperms would be seen. But what is required for fertility is we want them to have progressive movement further because sperms have to travel from the cervical external os till the fallopian tube in a stipulated time. We all know that egg survives for 24 hours, sperms may survive for 48 to 72 hours. So whatever has to happen, they, it has to coincide in this particular period, then only there would be conception. And in this case, if they fuse together, we want the endometrium, the decidua to be very receptive, then only this embryo will come and get rested or implanted in the uterine cavity. If something goes wrong in between, there will not be a conception. So for this, we want a sperm's particularly progressive movement, which gets affected due to the presence of anti-sperm antibodies. Infections in vagina and cervix, kind of chlamydial cervicitis, they also impair the formal motility, progressive motility. If the cervical mucus is absent totally, maybe because of the cervix has been amputated in further gills or because of some CA cervix, CI, and I should not say CA cervix, but if there was a CI and detected one or two and then the portion of the cervix is either ablated or excised, in that case, cervical glands are absent and there is total absence of cervical mucus. Cervical mucus is very important for a conception to take place. So absence of this will affect sperm motility and that will lead to infertility. Even sometimes because after these procedures of ablation or excision, there can be a simple cervical stenosis. It gets closed totally the os and it will avoid sperm entry upwards that will lead to infertility again. Other causes like peritoneal causes in which there would be endometriosis as a important cause and commonly found. Almost 50% of infertile patients when we investigate either by laparoscopy or some other methods, we find that endometriosis is present in them. That usually makes the peritoneal environment hostile. There are endometriotic patches, they are releasing this chocolate kind of substance, tarry secretions. Then there is presence of tumor necrotizing factor, interleukins, uh, phagocytosis takes place, the sperms they get phagocytosed. So the whole environment which is actually sperm friendly or very friendly for conception becomes hostile because of presence of this endometriotic disease. Other important thing, they cause adhesions, either peritubal or pelvic adhesions because of which the tube even though it looks it appears patent the tube gets stretched kinked for having physiological function the tube has to have that wavy pattern it should be freely mobile in the peritoneal cavity and that ciliary action should be very swift but because of these adhesions these movements they get affected tubes is either stretched or kinked or there is 
partial or complete blocks and that affects the fertility. In general, chronic ill health of the female will also lead to infertility in the form of hypothalamic or pituitary diseases, severe hypothyroidism or adrenocortical dysfunctions. So these were major causes of female infertility. Now we are going to investigate her further. We are going to see that how we should draw the history, what should be the points to be focused on examination and then how we should investigate her. So in the history, age, menstrual history is very important. Age is important, we have already explained. Menstrual history will tell us whether she is having ovulatory menses or anovulatory menses. We should always rule out history of tuberculosis, diabetes, thyroid diseases in that particular female. Then coital history in which we should ask about the frequency, whether the coitus is taking place properly, is there any history of contraception being used. So this history guides us going towards which factor is involved in that particular couple. Then when we examine the patient, we should take height of the patient first because most of the syndromes you know, height is quite important to diagnose certain syndromes. Weight, obesity affects, underweight affects, anorexia, you know, hypothalamic uh, effects. Then over patient with a lot of exertion, some athlete, they also have some hormonal imbalances. So we have to consider these points. Blood pressure. Signs of hirsutism, that will tell us whether she has any PCOD kind of picture. So see that whether she has extra hair growth on her body. Look for thyroid swelling, palpate lymph nodes. Breast examination is very important in an infertile female because if there is galactorrhea or some secretions found that suggest high level of prolactin then we can either go for that prolactin, you know, that it depresses FSH and LH and there would be an ovulation. There can be even pituitary tumors. So breast for some secretion is very important. Again, from the breast growth, you can get some clue towards any syndrome in present in that particular patient. Even periareolar hair would suggest of PCOD. So don't miss base examination in these patients. Per abdominally, we have to palpate her to rule out any pelvic masses, maybe fibroid or ovarian tumors. PV examination should be bimanual. Per speculum, look for any evidence of any local infections. Then bimanual examination, see how is the uterus, size of the uterus, mobility in the fornaces if there are any masses. Again, ovarian, tubal, endometriotic rule out any pathology. If there is fornicial tenderness, then it may suggest PID. So these are the things which we should rule out on examination. Now we will stop for a while and then we will see how we are going to investigate for each cause individually with the special tests available. Thank you.